Hello, hello, Kako. This is Kenson again coming to you from the beautiful island of Maui. Well, as you can see from the uh, title, I'd like to share a little bit about what our life will be like in heaven. And what got me thinking about this is the last two videos I talked about uh, our time in Papua New Guinea. And I made mention that before we went to PNG in the late 70s, we had to fulfill a uh, three-month course on cross-cultural education or preparing ourselves to enter into another culture. And I remember um, one of the things that they taught us in that course was that it takes at least three months before you really begin to see uh, if you will uh, adapt to the new culture. And I guess most people do adapt, but some people don't and they have a very difficult time and those are the people that end up are coming back home. Uh, so I was thinking about heaven because we are going to a place that we've never been to before and we know very little about really. And so uh, what kind of cross-cultural uh, education can we get in terms of going to heaven? This is going to be a brief discussion about that because there really is not much uh, in the scripture about what our life will be like in heaven. But I took this picture right here from a book that uh, was written by um, Anthony Di, uh, Di Stefano. His book was entitled A Travel Guide to Heaven for Kids. And it was illustrated by Erwin Madrid who drew this uh, gorgeous picture. And I like this picture because this picture illustrates what many of us uh, think and feel that heaven will be like. It, uh, uh, simply a paradise. Uh, a, a beautiful place with no imperfections and we're going to have wings so we can fly and be among the clouds where the birds fly and uh, look down upon this, these beautiful vistas of pristine rivers and waterfalls and perpetual rainbows and the beautiful sunlight etc. And this is a picture we kind of have of of heaven, at least that's all we're taught when, maybe when we were kids. But th this picture um, is not necessarily what we get from scripture, but a lot of it comes from uh, um, people like we call it a near-death experience when they come back and they they tell us what they saw. Some of it, some of it is from that, but other most of it is from speculation and from our imagination how of how we think. Heaven uh, will and should be like. When you when you read the scripture, though, the, this picture right here probably comes closer to uh, what the reality will be, and is that heaven is a place of, of extraordinary uh, beauty, but it is a place uh, filled with myriad of angels, angels praising God, surrounding uh, surrounding his his throne room, and in fact, the the one uh, ubiquitous word that we see in these descriptions of heaven in the Bible is the word throne. You know, we're, we're always picturing and, and given, given a picture of God sitting on his throne. And I think this might be one of the biggest uh, uh, cross, cross cultural um, things that we're going to have to overcome. We need to remember that heaven is not a democracy. That's why I've crossed that out. A democracy is a compound word, that the word democracy comes from the word dem demos and kratia. In fact, the Greek word for democracy is demos kratia. And the word demos means uh, people, and kratia means rule. And so basically democracy is people rule, or the rule of the people, which is what in many uh, Western countries we see. But it's not a democracy in heaven. It, in fact, is a theocracy. Theocracy, theos, meaning God. And again, the word kratia, krasi, meaning rule, is the place where God rules. And he sits on his throne. You know, in a democracy, we oftentimes discuss whether we like what the government is doing, or the prime minister, or the president. And we can have these free dis uh, discussions because we have the freedom of speech. But in a theocracy, there is no room for this kind of uh, discussion. You know, is God being fair? Should he have done this? There's no room for that. In fact, there was one person 
he was an angel, a very high angel, and he started the murmurings going on in heaven. And he had these thoughts in his heart that God wasn't fair, that he could actually be better than God. And so he had these ambitions of being like the Most High and attaining to that position in heaven. Of course, you know that angel's name was Lucifer, and we know him today as Satan. But in heaven, God rules, period, full stop. There is no discussion to this. There is no ambiguity to this. God sits on his throne, and he is both the executive branch, the legislative, and the judicial. He acts as the lawgiver, as the judge, and as the king who executes his rules and his laws. And that's the way it is, and that's the way it always will be. And so when we prepare to go to heaven, we need to keep this in mind, that God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and the rest of us are merely his servants, as we're going to see later on. That's going to be a, an issue for people who are not used to, to that. I'm, I'm speaking about you know, Christians who live in de democratic societies, and we need to get in that into our head, that in heaven things are not the same as here on earth. Let me point you to a verse, one of the verses that have this uh, idea in mind, and it comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. In Isaiah, chapter 6, Isaiah is a young man, but he is uh, thinking about the death of a very old king, King Uzziah. He ruled since the age of 16, his, his age was 16, and he ruled for 52 years until he finally died. Much of his reign was a good time. He was a good king, except for the latter part after the uh, prophet Zechariah died and Uzziah kind of lost his way. And you remember the story, he went into the temple to offer sacrifice and the priests were trying to drag him out and he resisted and all of a sudden leprosy started to form on his forehead and from that day on he was a leper and, a, and they, they shut him away in a different part of the palace until the day that he died. But the people loved him, he, he was a good king and they must have been shaken. And so Isaiah says in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord, he's talk, talking about God, sitting upon a throne, and here you have it right here, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, some of us who do not live in a country that, it has, that is not used to a monarchy like the Commonwealth countries are, you know, we might not be familiar with what is this thing about a train. I remember back in 1981 when we came home on furlough for three months to see our supporters and to raise more support. But uh, it, it had been three continuous years without a break in Papua New Guinea, and now we were able to come home for three months. But uh, that time actually coincided with a very special event that was going on in London, and I'm talking about the wedding of Diana Spencer to Prince Charles, the heir of the, to the throne. And I remember we were in a motel in Los Angeles preparing to return to Hawaii and eventually back to Papua New Guinea for another three years. But uh, we were made aware of this event because in Papua New Guinea, which is a Commonwealth uh, nation, most of the expatriates were from Commonwealth nations like Britain or Canada or Australia or New Zealand and they made mention of this event that was coming up and here we were in Los Angeles in a motel and I remember that they were going to broadcast it live so I turned the TV on at about 1 or 2 in the morning and there it was and the thing that struck me was how long the train of her gown was. I mean people have trains, usually it's the, it's the hem of the gown in the back that kind of drags on the ground but she actually had this long train of 25 feet. And here you see an official portrait of her in this room right here. But what does this train represent for the bride? Well, her whole outfit, her gown, her veil, the train, all in white. What it, what it does is it, it symbolizes and it magnifies her purity as a bride. You know, 
mostly in the olden days, maybe not so much today, but the brides were virgins and they were pure and they were getting married. And so this whole um, you know, wardrobe was to magnify her purity. Well, in, in, in the book of Isaiah 6, when, when Isaiah talks about the train of God, the Lord, filling the temple, what, what, is, what was he talking about there? He's talking about the purity of God himself. His holiness filled the temple. That's what he means when he says his train filled the temple. His glory and his purity, his holiness filled the temple. And if you go on, you read on the following verses. He talks about the seraphim who were hovering around God on his throne, calling out and in, in antiphonal chorus, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now that must have been, we say in Hawaii, in a chicken skin moment, you know, where it was just stunning to see this. And uh, Isaiah was stunned in, in that vision as well. But uh, that, that's one of the uh, great visions of God where Isaiah sees him on the throne. And when we get to heaven, Jesus is going to be sitting on the throne as well. This is what we read in the book of Revelation. This is at the very end of the book of Revelation. And he's talking about um, the vision of the New Jerusalem right here. And he, he's, he's saying that in the New Jerusalem, there shall be no more curse. That means the curse that came upon mankind in Genesis chapter 3, at the very beginning of the uh, books of the scriptures, it talks about the sin of man, Adam and Eve, and the curse that comes upon all of us. Not, up, not only upon us, but upon all of creation and upon this world. But when Jesus sits on his throne in the New Jerusalem, there shall be no more curse, no more death, no more dying, no more disease, no more pain, no more suffering. And all of creation is going to be renewed. And then he goes on in his vision, he says, But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. It's going to be in the New Jerusalem. So the New Jerusalem not only is a palace for the King of Kings, but it's also a temple for the King of Kings. Because the King of Kings is no other than God Himself, Yahweh Himself, sitting on that throne. And then we come to our part. And His servants, these are the believers, those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and His death and blood shed for their sins. And they've been willing to admit their guilt and their, they are sinful, but they wanted something more from life and they wanted to you know, have God's forgiveness. And these are His servants, these people that have received Christ. What are they, are they going to be doing? They shall serve Him. That's what they're going to be doing. That's what we're going to be doing. This word servant is the word doulos in the Greek, and it's the word that is translated bond servant or bond slave. It's the very same word that Paul uses for himself where he says, I am Paul, a bond servant or bond slave of Christ Jesus. What do servants do? They serve. And then in verse 5, And they shall reign forever and ever. How do we serve Christ? We are going to serve Him by assisting Him and joining Him in His reign over the new earth. And in fact, even over the millennial earth. They shall reign forever and ever. Now let me ask you, are you right now a servant of God? Do you enjoy serving Him? Would others characterize you if they had to describe you as a servant of God? You see, because that's what we're going to be doing forever. And if you're not you're used to that, it's going to be a real culture shock when you get to heaven. You realize it's not going to be Disneyland up there. It's not going to be a forever vacation. But it's going to be a place where we serve the King of Kings and the God Almighty. And we are going to reign with Him forever and ever. Would, would people also describe you as one who leads others to Christ, who, who teaches them and leads them for Christ? Because that's also what we're going to be doing. We're going to be reigning with Him over a new earth with, and a whole new creation. 
So these are the things that are going to might be a shock to people, but these are these are the things that we can prepare ourselves even right now to prepare ourselves for our forever home in heaven. When we get to heaven, we are going to be Jesus' servants. In this beautiful picture by Jeff Haney called the Lion of Judah, we see Jesus on his throne, the iron a rod in his hand, which is his scepter, the symbol of his authority, which Jesus has told us is authority in all heaven and earth. And when we think of that, we, we're thinking, man, that doesn't sound, you know, really, that doesn't sound good. Maybe that's what you're thinking in your head. But you know, it is, a, it is going to be the greatest thing. Because David in Psalm 1611, he, he finishes the psalm by, by stating what it's going to be like. He says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. You know, not only does Jesus show us the path of life here and now, He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But He's going to continue showing us the path of life through all eternity. He's going to be teaching us, and we're going to be learning more and more about life, about His creation, about the infinite God. That's going to be exciting already. And then David says, And in thy presence is fullness of joy. The word joy here means gladness. You know, there will never be a sad tear in your eye, ever. And you will never, there, you, there won't be any depression like there is on this earth and people taking Valium or other you know, drugs to cure their depression or at least minimize it. No, joy, heaven is going to be a joyful place. You know, serving Jesus is going to be the most joyful thing that we can ever do in our life. And then he, he finally says, And at thy right hand, this is the hand of authority where Jesus sits, at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now we're not talking about carnal pleasures. We're not talking about fleshly pleasures. The, the best word that I can uh, equate this with is a Hawaiian word. The word is ona ona. Ona ona, ona means the uh, joy that you experience when you listen to this beautiful music. You think of the most a melodic Hawaiian music, the strumming of the ukulele and the guitar and the beautiful voices of the singers. That, that feeling of pleasure in the Hawaiian is called ona ona. And people might say, hey, ona ona, ona no. And talking, talking about the, uh, the sounds that the, these musicians are permeating the air with. It, it also describes the uh, fragrances of the leis and the flowers of Hawaii. You know, I think about the ginger in the lays, or the pakalana, or the uh, pikake, or the, um, the plumeria lays. You know, these beautiful uh, smelling lays. When you come to a graduation ceremony in Hawaii, the, the fragrance just permeates the air. And the feeling that you get when you smell, smell that is ona ona, the pleasure of these beautiful fragrances. And David says, and at thy right hand, it will be ona ona forevermore, where these, there's this sense, this feeling of bliss and of just complete enjoyment is there. And that's what it's going to be like serving Christ in heaven, because we will have our new bodies that will be powerful and celestial and spiritual and immortal. And we will never, ever fatigue or get tired. And it will be a joy to serve Christ. It will be a just a thing of pleasure to be used by him as his servants. And uh, that's what it's going to be like to live in heaven. And you know, I cannot wait because I enjoy serving Christ here on earth. How much more is going to be up there when it will be infinitely more enjoyable to be with him and to hear him teach and to be serving him day and night throughout eternity. Praise God. What is it like living in heaven? Ona ona. Gladness, joyful, pleasurable. Amen. May God bless you. May, he, may you experience His aloha, His love, and His malama, His caring for you. Aloha no. Amen. <laughs>